saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Today is Tuesday, June the 8th, and we gather this next hour around the gift of the inspired and true Word of God and the Holy Spirit this Pentecost season helps us to put on our Christ goggles as we study the end of 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5 is well known for Naaman and his healing of leprosy, and it ends verse 14 right before our text today, and he says, and he was clean. What a reminder for us, and not only for Naaman, but also for us by the blood of Christ, we are made clean. And what happens after they are made clean? It seems like, well, everything is going to go and, and fat and happy and be able to move forward, but not quite exactly what happens here today. Selfishness, greed, everything else. And it shows us our need for the law and even more so need for the gospel. And we will give both this morning because the gifts are ready, ready for you. Thank you to our friends from Lutheran Heritage Foundation for your support of Thy Strong Word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. To help us be strengthened by God's Word, we have with us regular guest, Pastor John Lekomsky, co-host of Wrestling with the Basics and also now living in Minnesota. Pastor (laughs) Lekomsky, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Yeah, so so you what are you an hour an hour and a half north of where I'm at, Brady? Yep, yep, north west, uh, north uh, west, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so are, are you got ninety six degrees, ninety seven degrees today, Brady? Or, yep, or is that you bet. hour and a half? Okay, because you know that's uh, we are when more I came north, up yeah. here. <laughs> I came up here to get the nice seventy five. That's the normal temperature, mm, <laughs> and, and since see? we've been here, it's like twenty degrees over that, or even more. We hit a hundred here in Northfield a couple yeah. of days ago. Yeah. Um, but I think I understand that, Brady. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, even though I, I, I might complain to you because you told me how nice it was up in Minnesota. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I did. Cool. I did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How cool it gets at certain uh, times of year. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but apparently so, I'm going to have to wait. i wait for that cool. <laughs> absolutely. Not, you are going to have yeah. to wait. You are going to have to uh, wait. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of a step back for you, our listeners. And I am I have before me a book called, and this is for Pastor Lekomsky, and for any of you, our listeners, if you come to visit Minnesota, I have a book be- before me. It's called The Visitor Guide to Minnesota, How to Talk Minnesotan. <laughs> so this is going to be my attempt to do a little Prairie Home Companion um, for our time today. So in case you come into Minnesota, there's a few words that are very important for Minnesotans to use, and it's good for you to be able to interpret them, and for you, Pastor uh, Lekomsky, for you to use them. And the word is you bet. Okay. Have you used this yet, Pastor? Oh, Have you of used course. It yeah, I'm here familiar go. with the book you're talking about. Yes, that, that's it required is. if you're going to live in Minnesota, because otherwise, <laughs> even you, for you could not communicate. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So let me read this to you today for a little bit of Prairie Home Companion. You bet is a very important word for the typical Minnesotan, and it's something that brings you into the the the, the breath and joy of what it means to be a Minnesotan. Because a common use is in response to a thank you or I appreciate it. If you buy something in a Minnesota store, say a bag, of course, that's how you say it, or two of tiny (laughs) marshmallows for a salad, of course, for your typical Minnesota potluck, the sales clerk might say to you, thank you, in which in case you say, you bet. But generally, the custom is that the customer says thank you at first in Minnesota. That is the way it should be. And then the clerk says, you bet. You bet is mainly used as a question to answer questions. If you can't think of anything to say, you say, you bet. You bet is meant to be pleasantly agreeable and doesn't obligate you to have a strong opinion. Of course, what would be a situation in Minnesota that a Minnesotan would have a strong opinion? You'll say in the time like today, is it warm enough for you? You always say, you bet. Someone says Governor Walls has been keeping a pretty low profile post-COVID, hasn't he? And you say, no matter how you vote, you bet. <laughs> and sometimes the question is only implied. I kind of like flannel pajamas. You say, you bet. The humidity is sort of gets you is, is sort of getting you today, isn't it? You bet. And if it is really hot, you try not to be too much of a strong opinion, and you just say, you bet. 
So there it is. Is that helpful, Pastor Lukomsky? <laughs> that is. And of course, today, in regards to the temperature, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, and, and, I, and I, I would add this. Yeah, you know, so that's that's actually the version for the people that are not native. Because if you're native, you would actually say you betcha. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You, you, exactly you, you right. You fill it out there. But but yeah, you bet. That. <laughs> For the non-natives. <laughs> so this is a good, we'll have some of these moments. I have this book. One of my members gave it to me. And we'll be having some of these moments with Pastor Lukomsky when he comes on the program. So be ready <laughs> to learn a little more about Minnesota. And I'm hoping... Um, we also will make an announcement when Pastor Lukomsky and I get together for lunch at uh, um, somewhere in Northfield. And we'll say, hey, if you're listening, come on over at such and such a time. Hopefully that works, too. What do you think? I think that would be exciting. In fact, yeah, I've, got a, I've got a stepdaughter who's just chomping at the bit because she wants to meet you in the worst way. So. <laughs> <laughs> poor, she listens to all of lady. your episodes. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Does she live in Northfield? <laughs> She yes, yes she does. Oh, yeah, my yeah, goodness. Yeah. Oh, so my. She'll, okay. She'll be there at our lunch for sure. So. Well, one of our uh, one of our track athletes, because I coach track, and right now, by the way, not fun to coach track in 95-degree no, weather. No, that's what I was thinking, um, too, yeah. No, but, uh, but yeah, one of our athletes is going to Carleton next year, so that's ah, quite exciting cool. to uh, – to know she's going there. But anyways, we're here back in the farm, back back to the scriptures. And Pastor, can you begin us in prayer to get us back on track? <laughs> oh, Lord, we just, we well, we rejoice even in the heat, okay, because we know all things come from you, uh, all good things. And, and today, this is just a wonderful text. Help us to hear this text, to have it strike our heart, both in terms of a call to repentance, but certainly also in a word of encouragement and a word of hope. Uh, and a word to strengthen our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Reminder to our listeners, if you have any questions concerning 2 Kings chapter 5, send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org. Or, um, as we are doing now doing, Pastor, call us, 1-800-730-2727, 1-800-730-2727. Oh, and I keep forgetting the other one. Uh, you know, in, in today's world, you don't really need a local or a toll-free number because everyone has a cell phone, but you I can call so. also. Yep. Yeah, at 314-821-0850, 314-821-0850. So, um, yeah, so call it in if you need. We've had a couple callers in the last week, which has been a lot of fun. And, of course, I will always divert and give it to Pastor Lukomsky to answer. So. I think we're ready. <laughs> and if it's a tough question, I will divert and give it back to you. <laughs> exactly. We'll keep asking. Maybe someone will call in and give us the answer. No. Anyways. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, Pastor, we are, you know, when I talked about this yesterday in Second Kings chapter 5, we had uh, Dr. Dr. Thomas Egger, who's now the president of Concordia Seminary, on. And it was it was a wonderful just looking at it with fresh eyes, the story of Naaman and the healing. And as, as I said this morning, it ends with uh, he was clean and we get to the second half. And this is a story you don't necessarily learn in Sunday school a story that maybe you kind of you, you stop there. I know I've done it as a pastor. You just stop at verse 14. And but the next piece shows us a lot of gems. So, Pastor, what kind of themes or background contextual things you want to highlight to help us out? Well, well you know, Brady, as we, we've talked about the previous doing with Kings, uh, I, I believe it is a book of tragedy. Uh, mm. and, and we have to remember it's being written to people who have lost everything. Uh, their temple's been destroyed. Uh, they feel like they can't worship God anymore because they can't make the sacrifices and the things that were required at the temple. Uh, they've lost their, their kingdom. Uh, they've lost all their personal property. They're exiles in, in Babylon. And I think one of the purposes is to explain why this is. Because that's when we have trouble, when we have struggles. Mm -hmm. we, we wonder why. And that's why this story actually ends sadly. But like you say, it should be a really happy, upbeat story, as you alluded in your introduction. But it has a very, very sad ending. But I think there's a purpose to that. And I think the author's saying, now you know why you're having problems, too. You've got probably mm -hmm. the same things that happened to Gehazi. And yet in the middle of this, or, or actually it's at the beginning for you and me. <laughs> it's in the yeah. middle of the whole story. We, we have this beautiful thing of hope. Uh, which I think was intended to encourage these people who had lost everything. And it is, you always talk about the Jesus goggles, Brady. And mm -hmm. I think it is probably one of the clearest Jesus things 
uh, in, in the, the Old Testament. In fact, there is something that is said in these verses we are going to study that could not be said apart from Jesus Christ and the things he accomplished through his suffering, death, and resurrection. So uh, at the same time, it's a very sad story. A at the same time, there is this beautiful element of faith and hope that's just so crystal clear uh, that it would cause any of us, especially those of us who are repentant, those of us who can kind of identify with Gehazi here, uh, mm -hmm. it would cause us to, to uh, rejoice. So anyway, that's my introduction. All right. Well, that kind of gives us a anticipation. It's like the end of a movie and waiting for the sequel. I mean, you just left us on the cliff, and I can't wait to hear more <laughs> about Jesus this morning. So let us dig in. Reminder to our listeners that we'll be reading from the English Standard Version and open up our Bibles, and let's do this. We are in Second Kings chapter 5, and we'll begin in verses 15 and 16. Then he, Naaman, returned to the man of God, who would be Elisha, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Now, I want, I want to stop there because we see one of the highlights I found in this in my study is just this wonderful. He goes back to Elisha and says, hey, um, there is no other God. This is a guy from Syria. You know, this is a guy that that probably worshiped other gods. He knows there's one true God and he wants to do this in generosity. This is the Lord has has come to him in his word. He's given him mercy. Now he wants to extend this mercy. I can't help but not think about, you know, Second Corinthians. Corinthians chapter 8, when it talks about how, um, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus said, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Just that understanding of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, where it points us to generosity. It flows from our Lord. We give to others. Naaman wants to do it. And then that's another cliffhanger. Um, Elisha says, no. <laughs> so <laughs> what's your thoughts on this? I thought it was just a wonderful, um, like, wow. Boy, how does he feel about this? But it, 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 there's more to the story, obviously. But I just thought that the Lord gives us his generous heart and he doesn't accept it. Any thoughts on these verses? Okay, so so, so exactly. So, you know, we Lutherans, uh, we, we like to say faith alone. But but faith is never alone. I, I didn't make that up. Someone mm. else made. Do you mm -hmm. know who said? I don't. Whatever. Yeah. No, yeah faith alone, but it's never good. faith. And and so you're right. So you see this. He's experienced the generosity of God, and we're going to highlight that as we talk a little bit about this story. And, and and that caused you to respond. We love as God first loved us. That that that's the passage mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But as you look at this, though. I, I I did not did not notice this in, until just minutes before the show. Name Naaman actually disappears in these verses. You you had to you had to tell us who the he is, right? Uh, when sure. you read it, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. all of a sudden, and in fact, if you look back, the last time we heard from Naaman, quote unquote, was when he was angry. <laughs> okay? Right, true. Mm -hmm. And I I I don't think that's a fluke. I I think the author is saying this is not the Naaman you. Met earlier, we have a new name and now a name and that's been changed by the grace of God, by the by the mercy of God. Because of course, if you're a Jew reading this, this is what shocks you. Because Naaman should not be healed. Naaman is one of the oppressors. In fact, the story begins with Naaman having captured an Israelite girl. You know, why would this guy get anything from God? Uh, and, and yet the surprising thing is this fellow has faith. He believes that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. And then we have this powerful, so accept now a present from your servant. Uh, one of the things we're going to have to do, Brady, is, is kind of unpack some of the English translation here, because the English obscures, mm -hmm. they obscure what's going on in this text. Because this is a very powerful word. Uh, it's the and, and by the way, there's probably somebody who's really smart who knows how to pronounce Hebrew. Probably you. <laughs> is it Ebed? Ebed or Ebed? Do you know? Uh, I said I say yeah. Ebed, but you know what? Who uh, knows? Uh, you say Ebed. I <laughs> somebody say knows. Ebed. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Eve. But but the fact is, it, it's the word for slave. 
Mm-hmm. Now, 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 admittedly, uh, Hebrew doesn't have a lot of words. <laughs> so one word has to have several meanings, and it can simply mean servant. But, but you can't take away the humility of a Syrian army commander coming to an Israelite prophet and saying, I am your slave, okay? Right, okay. In fact, it's the same word that's used in the previous chapter of this man's, Naaman's relationship to his king. He's also an Ebed to the king of... So I'm, I'm just saying, that's a powerful thing for a man who literally could destroy Elisha and his all of his followers right then and there. They, they've mm. done it, they've defeated the Israelites before, and yet this man now... Uh, if not physically, at least emotionally, has prostrated himself. Uh, and, and is it because Elijah? No, no, it's because of Elijah's God, because I now know he's right. the only God in all the earth, you know, that this it. So no, no, I'm your servant. You tell me. And in fact, I want to do something. And isn't that what Christianity is about? Not doing what you have to, but doing it because I really want to, because I know mm. what kind of a great God you have. And what's interesting, that's one part I didn't um, I didn't catch before, but you're right, is that 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 he presents himself. First of all, he doesn't say truly this is like in the, in, with Jesus, right? They said, well, truly, you yeah. are a, a manly, a, a, a godly man, you know, or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. But here he's just like, there is only one God. So please, I will be your servant, admitting that, well, this man is from God. And throughout, that's one of the unique things about Elisha. They're kind of like. That guy is with the word of God. That's a man of God right there. Um, and they speak very highly of him and confess that he is the one true God. And then he prostrates himself, like you said. Not, not only, hey, I want to give you some clothes and some silver or something. He's like, I'm giving my whole self to you. Yes. So he's not giving us a little bit. He's giving everything. So that's a, I guess I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think much about that. I thought about the end of the text. So other thoughts on those? On those words? Um, well, I, I, actually, this helps me explain why it's so hot up here. <laughs> okay, go <laughs> because, ahead. Because, you see, I forgot that God is the God of all the earth. <laughs> and and, and yeah. therefore, if I want to be cool, I've got that under my control. All I have to do uh, is go to Minnesota. and I'll Because, see, I'm the one in charge of providing cool weather. Mm, and God mm-hmm. said, no, I'm God of all the earth, Minnesota as well as St. Louis. And if I want to make it warm and Minnesota, I can make it warm in Minnesota. <laughs> there you go. So, See, problem solved. So, problem solved. So, so when the cool weather comes, <laughs> I will say thank you, Lord. Not because I was so smart to come to Minnesota in June, but because you are the giver of pleasant weather wherever I find pleasant weather. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, it's funny. That's um, funny. So here's another see, um, yeah. another situation here, too. One of the problems for uh, for Naaman is that he didn't know the Minnesota rule. Um, and the Minnesota <laughs> rule is is that when, when, when you, if someone asks you for food, they say, would you like some food, like some coffee or whatever, you go to their house. The Minnesota of rule is you don't want to look like you are taking from people so you act <laughs> humble and you and you refuse three times after three times it's okay to accept it at that point so if he would have asked him three times a trinitarian number um he would have taken him as his servant so just he didn't know that rule how he about didn't that? Know that isn't this that great isn't this great it does there's so many applications i'm so glad to be in minnesota with you Brady. <laughs> oh it's good stuff, and, and, good stuff. anyways and, and just just adding on it, don't, don't you think that that's why that's why uh, uh, Elisha refuses uh, the gift of Naaman, because he doesn't want any confusion with this rookie, this this new believer, this this baby go. believer. Uh, I, I'm glad it's a good thing you want to do good for me. But, you know, you know, no, that's not why you got this. It's not like I, I know how you understand it works, Naaman, with your gods. Uh, you do something that God does something for you. God does something for you. Do something for him. You know, quid pro quo, but not mm-hmm. with the God of the earth, not with the Israel God. No, he just gives good things. And if you give back, well, that's good. But but he doesn't you don't need to do that to get, get the blessings that he wants to bestow upon you. So I think that the rejection of the gift here is simply to say this is all about grace and Mm. and in your new faith i don't want any confusion in your mind but this is all about the the grace of god 
Yeah. And, and that is very clear in verse 16, as Elisha says, as the Lord Yahweh lives. Um, yeah. He's definitely not doing it out of, well, you know, I don't want you guys to think too highly of me. You know, I don't want you guys. No, it's about the Lord. This is all about the Lord and thanks and praise to him. So let's keep moving and, forward. And, and, I, and, no, and, no, and, no, isn't that typical of Minnesota, too? <laughs> Minnesotans, they, no, no, it's not me. No, Ooh. no, don't, don't thank me. <laughs> yeah, but inside we are, we're very much so. We're very internal narcissists. We just don't want you to know about it. Yeah, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's keep moving uh, forward. Let's keep moving right. forward. Verses 17 through 19. Then Naaman said, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mules load of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt set offering or sacrifice to any God but the Lord Yahweh. In this matter, may the Lord Yahweh pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimon to worship there, l- leaning on my arm and bow myself to the house of Rimon. When I bow myself to the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. And he said to him, go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance. Oh, excuse me. I'm gonna, I should have stopped. I'll stop at go in peace and then go I'll read peace. the rest yeah, later. I think that's a good place so, to start. Yeah, so, yeah. so so, here, this is this is interesting. So he's kind of like, okay, but you know what? And this is one of the commentaries I read. I want to hear your thoughts on it. Is sure. He says, okay, but I, I need some I need some earth. You know, I need I need two meals load of earth. Um, and this is interesting because in our congregation, we have excavation, a, a, a family that owns excavation companies. So they're, they're always the guys that I'll say, hey, uh, yeah. Gracky brothers, I need some dirt. And so the next day there's <laughs> dirt on my front lawn. You know, it's wonderful. But anyways, so we need some dirt. And one of the commentaries said this. They said um, his understanding. And this is where he clearly was. He knew there's one God, but he wasn't quite sure how this works. The commentary said that that he wants the dirt from the Holy Land to take with him to Syria so that when he offers sacrifices that he's doing it, quote, on the on the holy ground. You know, it's like Moses, take off your sandals. This is holy ground. I need to take it with me and to go from there. Did you, did you read anything on this? Oh, yeah, and I, I agree with that completely. Yeah, mm. it's that whole pagan concept that, well, if he's the God of Israel, then I've got to have the, the land of Israel in order to probably worship him. Right. There's no way I could worship him without that that land of Israel. Yeah. No, I agree with that completely. And this and this is a good reminder of how easy it is for us, even as Christians, to kind of um, segment things in life where like you, you go there somewhere. Let's say the Holy Land. OK, I got water from the Jordan River and then you take it back and then I got baptized with the Jordan water, that kind of thing or whatever it might be. Oh, yeah. And how yeah. easy that is to do those kind of things um, to act as if it's more holy. I don't say it's wrong. It's not wrong. But if it gets to replacing the reality of who the Lord is, it, then then you just create more idols. Um, we already have enough idols. We don't need more of them. So any thoughts on that, how we might do that today? Well, I, I, and so I actually had a fella come and bring me a, a, a bottle of water from the Jordan. Uh, and, and I could tell that he really thought, well, this was exciting. And then again, I'm, I'm not like you say that. That's OK. I think yeah. I've, I've got if you want it when you come to see me, I'll bring my bottle of water from the Jordan. <laughs> but like you said, the, the danger is to think that somehow if I would baptize someone with the water from the River Jordan, would that be a b- no, no, that's a really dangerous thought, isn't it? That somehow it's the the. The, the location of the water that makes baptism effective uh, are, are not. Um, but see, here's what's, what's what I find is interesting. So remember now we got these Jewish people reading. They're reading. They're hearing this story. And, and I'm thinking at this point they're rolling their eyes for three reasons. Number one, oh, really? You have to have the dirt in order to worship God? How, how foolish can you be? Oh, really? You're going to bow down to Rimon and you want that mm. to be excused? Don't we all understand there is only one God? First commandment stuff. Uh, and you know what I think would have really aggravated them? That he says, in this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. And before, I will not offer any burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but the Lord. And mm. and for those who are following along, you will note that that word Lord is spelt in all four capital letters, which reminds us that that was actually the holy name of God, which mm. we pronounce as Yahweh. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit later, but not right now. Okay. Uh, um, and of course, if you're a Jew, you, you don't do that. That That's the name 
that is not to be spoken. And now, I, I, it's all right, I guess, for Elijah to speak it, because he's a man of God. Gehazi will speak it. And, well, you know, he's the, the boy of a man of God. But for a, a Syrian, a pagan, you mm. know, at this point, they're all up in arms. But, but Brady, don't you see, that's the point. This is what this is the God you have. This is the God of Israel. He's a God of complete and total grace. Now, there's nothing that you do to earn his love, his forgiveness, his healing. That's just the thing he gives. And yep, yep, he can give it to pagan Syrian commanders. That's in fact, that's what he wants to do. <laughs> he wants mm. to give it to all nations. Um and I'm wondering, do you think, Brady, that maybe there's a little tweak here for those Israelites who are sitting in Babylon moaning, oh, we can't worship God, we can't worship God. And I wonder if the author sure. isn't saying, so are you any different than the Naaman? Is that what you're saying? If I could bring a couple of truckloads of Jerusalem soil up here, would it be better? Or don't you understand that ours is the God of earth, which means he can be worshipped anywhere? even mm. when you are captive in a foreign nation. I think, you know, that's a, a great insight to that. I mean, at least it would have hit their ears in that way. Like, oh, yeah, yeah okay, all right, so we're not at the temple. Okay, we're still okay. And and you see that really from that time on. I mean, they're, they're um, you, he, you hear it in James and the people in the dispersion. And, I mean, they're all over the place. And we're studying the book of Acts and at our church, and, and you go into Athens, and he's like, God can be found in not one building. He is the Lord of all creation. I mean, this is a very common theme throughout um, the scriptures and a reminder for us that, you know what, um, there is there is Jesus. He has died for me. The, the gifts are ready and, and so forth. And the, of course, in America, we tend to take that different direction. I don't want to go there, but it is a reminder of that. Now, I want to touch about one thing um, and I want to maybe I just want to bring up the question. I'll bring up the question. Then I want you to answer it after the break. Okay. How's that? How's that? Okay. Pastor? That sounds good. Is sure. What's interesting to me is he's like, okay, I'm going to go worship at uh, this, the God of the house of Rimon. And, and how do we reconcile that with the words of Elijah, First Kings chapter 18? Make a choice, Baal or Yahweh. What are you going to do um, as he's standing before the sacrifices? And even Jesus, um, who's ever not with me, Luke chapter 11, is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. How do we reconcile what happens here with the rest of scripture, obviously for clarity's sake. But right now we need to take our break and Pastor John will get that after the break and we are studying 2 Kings chapter five with Pastor John Lekomsky. We'll be right back. The mission field isn't just overseas anymore. It's right here in your own backyard. If English isn't the first language of your neighbor or friend, and you'd like to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them in their own language, contact the Lutheran Heritage Foundation at lhfmissions.org. LHF has translated and published the small catechism, children's Bible stories, hymnals, and devotions into 85 different languages and gives them free of charge to those who need them. lhfmissions.org. The Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, on behalf of Concordia Plan Services, Lutheran Housing Support Corporation, Concordia University System, Lutheran Church Extension Fund, the LCMS Foundation, and Corporate Synod, daily reaches out to our members and partners, working together to support our local, global, and international ministries, church workers, and LCMS initiatives at large to carry the mission forward and to serve each other in love. Opportunities to serve, lcms.org careers. The USA is the third largest mission field in the world, and church planning is one of the most effective means of making new disciples, new missions to new people in new places. Get ready to plow the fields. Check out the Mission Field USA podcast produced by the LCMS Office of National Mission. You can find it at kfuo.org or anywhere you get your podcasts. And 
welcome back. We are studying 2 Kings chapter 5 with Pastor John Lekomsky. And the question I asked before is, it seems to me that Naaman's kind of like, well, I'm going to go back to Syria. I'm going to um, go to the house of Rimon, which is a another god in Syria. Um, pardon my servant beforehand. And how do we reconcile with that? 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah says, Baal or Yahweh, what are you going to choose? Luke chapter 11, uh, I suppose Joshua, you know, um, uh, who are you going to choose uh, as for me and my house? Uh, Jesus says, whatever, who's never not with me is against me. How do we reconcile all this together, Pastor? All right. So so this is actually where I, I see Jesus. Uh, ah, yes. so, so crystal clear in this text, particularly in the phrase, what is Elisha's answer to this? Elisha doesn't comment one way or the other. He doesn't say, well, that's a good thing to do. Uh, we would like him to say, oh, you can't do that. But he doesn't say that either. In fact, what he simply mm-hmm. says is, go in shalom, go in peace. And, and I'm thinking of Jesus after his resurrection, and he's dealing with people like Naaman who just, they don't quite get it yet. They, they do understand this, that there is only one God. And they do understand that Jesus is his son and their savior. And they know that much. We, we got to be sticking with Jesus. We're not going to go anywhere else. But they don't understand what the kingdom's about. You know, as you read the story, they still think Jesus is going to establish some kind of physical, earthly kingdom in in Jerusalem. Uh, In fact, the Bible tells us that even after the resurrection, some still doubt. And yet, what does Jesus say to them, Brady? He says, peace. And again, I say, Hmm. peace to you. Um, And and, and, and that that's the point here. We're not all where we should be. All of us are sinners. All of us have got things that we need to be thinking through. And and at least Naaman is doing that, right? Mm -hmm. Naaman Mm -hmm. isn't saying... It's okay if I go and, 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 and because I'm, I'm with my, my king and, you know, he's worshiping and, and what he does, I'm going to have to do because he kind of leans on me. He's not suggesting, well, that's okay. No, no, he says, I think that probably isn't right. I don't know what else I can do, though. Forgive me, right? Isn't that what he asked for? He says, mm-hmm. uh, pardon me, which is, which is the Hebrew word for, for forgiveness. Um, and this is so crucial because now we're going to move into the story of, of Gehazi. And, and he's going to mess up totally, <laughs> okay? There, there just is not one good thing he does. Uh, and, and that, again, is the call to repentance. I think I think the, the story that follows now is, is the author saying, look, you know why you're in exile. You know why. Because you didn't trust the Lord, all right? So don't act like you don't know what's going on. And the danger then is that we think, oh, okay, so it's just a matter of us doing the right things. If we do the right things, then everything would have been all right. And no, that's not that's not the faith of the New or the Old Testament. No, no, it is about turning to the Lord, trusting in the Lord. That's what it's always about. And of course, from that will come, come good things. But it's not about doing the good things. Uh, and I think that's why this story is a reminder that, that Naaman is still a sinner. Yes, he is. Mm-hmm. And he knows that. And he's repenting of that. And as long as you got that going on, then Jesus can say, go in peace. Uh, now it's when you forget that. And when you begin to think you are doing the right thing, and indeed, you've got everything under control, like like me thinking if I go north, I'll have all the cool weather. Mm. Well, that's when then there has to be a little bit of discipline. <laughs> and always done in love. I, I, when we get to Gehazi, it's a horrible ending, but you need to see even that's an act of God's love for the sake of that man, that servant. Well, anyway, does no, that answer very... the question? It's very helpful, yes, and and we look at it, and I like how you said it. It, it uh, you said it along the lines of so he's confessing the faith correctly, and think about how yes. we confess. This is the as the Lord. He said, "There's only one Lord in Israel," and and he's kind of just bringing up some stuff that just okay that might not be hundred percent right, but Elisha's a pastoral person. I mean, he's a man of God and he, he doesn't say, oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Just go. He's just like, go in peace. And I think about how often we need to do that with people because they're, they're burdened, their consciences are burdened. And they're like, what do I do in this situation? And probably the best response is to pray and say, go in peace and pray the Holy Spirit gives them wisdom as they go their way. And uh, you know what? This goes back to what we talked about before, not only wisdom, but faith to continue yeah. in faith and to be strong in him. So what a wonderful phrase. And this is what we do with the benediction at the end of a service. Just go in peace, which once again points away from us 
and points us to the Lord. Now, <laughs> any any last thoughts before we go to Gehazi? Well, well, yeah, and again, thinking about the people this was originally uh, written to, spoken to, heard mm. heard by. So, so yeah, now you know why you're in Babylon. You know why, because you worship these false gods. You did. You, you did exactly what Naaman was going to do, and you did it thinking it was the right thing to do. You didn't uh -huh. ask for pardon or forgiveness. But look at this. Look at your God. He wants to give you peace. He still wants to give you peace. So you know what you do when you're in Babylon? You keep praying to the Lord. And of course, we know that that story has a remarkable ending, that another leader, another pagan leader, will actually send them back to Jerusalem and order them and give them the money to build, to rebuild mm -hmm. the temple. Mm -hmm. You know, now if that isn't a powerful story about God's grace, but of course, they don't have that part of the story yet. The author of Chronicles now, I don't know if you're going to do Chronicles, he knows that story, and he has a whole different take on the same things that you've been reading in Kings. Uh, but at point. this point, it is, okay, you're a sinner, just like Naaman. You want to point your finger at Naaman, but you're a sinner too. But look at this. Look at what God does for a Naaman. Look at the grace and mercy he has, even when he still hasn't got things quite as clear as they should be. Uh, well, anyway. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Go and in peace. Go in we, peace. Yeah. Go in peace. That's that's our that's the Lord's call for us and for us to other people. So let's yeah. keep going here. We got verse uh, the end of verse nineteen into verse twenty. Could I could but, I say one thing quick before I, mm -hmm. I, I leave? Because I and again I did this is hot <laughs> off the press, Brady. Mm -hmm. and if if the Holy Spirit ain't working here today, I don't know. Because I just clicked on the word for go, go in peace. Uh -huh, it's yep. actually the word for, for to walk. Okay. So, so he, it, it is literally, of course, he's going to go back to Syria. But, but it's really more the sense of I've, you got the peace, don't you? Because you know there's only one God on earth. I know where you're going back. You're going to have some difficult situations now because you're going to be dealing with other pagans. Maybe, though, can you be a witness? Can you walk that path and testimony and show them? What a different man you are now because you've encountered the God mm. of the earth, the God of Israel. So I, I didn't even notice that until I just clicked on that word. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You think peace. about yeah. you walk in a new in a new way. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, this is this is really good. Now we're going to we're going to see someone who walks in not a new way or yeah. probably a bad, yeah. not a bad way. Absolutely. So we'll, at the end of verse 19. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared this name in the Syrian, in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So I'm having a hard time pronouncing his name, but what, how do you say Ge Ge Gehazi? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you have no Do idea. Do not either. ask okay. me to pronounce Gehazi. Words. No, I'll say Gehazi, yeah, and we'll see what we'll, comes we'll out. We'll go with yeah, okay. Gehazi. I, yeah, my my <laughs> wife, my wife is one of those people that's so pronunciation. She gets on my my case because I I say the the, the magi, right? The three. No, no, they're not magi. She says they're the magi. It's it's oh, the plural no. of magi. Oh Lord have so, mercy. So okay. I don't All know. Right. I don't we're, know we're going to go with what Gehazi? Is that what Ge we're going Gehazi. with? Gehazi. 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 Yeah, yeah, I like that. Gehazi. Yeah, Gehazi. Gehazi. Yes. Gehazi. It's a yeah. Minnesota yeah. translation. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> so Gehazi. <laughs> Gehazi uh, is a servant of Elisha. We hear of him a few times before this point. Nothing like we're seeing today. Um, and he sees what, hap sees what happens here. And he sees an opportunity. What is his opportunity that he sees? All right, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna deflect that question for just a second. Oh, okay, go for here, it. Here, well, no, here's here's the business about the English translation that I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so sure. it says in the English, the servant of Elisha, and so we're thinking mm -hmm. Abed again, right? Just just like mm -hmm. what we had earlier. Okay, so now I'm I'm acknowledging that that he's the servant or the slave of Elisha. But, but the author has chosen a totally different word here. It is the word, and again, God help me, <laughs> Na'ar, I think. Na'ar? And, uh, yeah, Na'ar, we'll say that's what it is. But it's actually the word that generally means a young person, uh, a, a, a child. Um, and, and we use that in English, too, although I don't know that we can use it anymore because of, but, but we use that, that's my boy, right? You've got somebody that assists you there at the church. Oh, my boy, I'll take care of that. 
or, or if you were if you were a lord and lady, uh, I, I, you might have a girl. Uh, yes, the girl will take care of that, right? Uh, uh, now, I'm not I'm not denying that it, it probably means servant here, but I think it's very very striking that the author chooses not to use the word that we've heard over and over again, but he chooses yet a different word. And you know why he chooses to use the word na'ir here or the word boy? Because it's the same word he began with, with the little girl, only it was the uh, feminine form of that word. Sure. And okay. See, okay. see what he's doing. He said, now let's go back to where we started. Remember this Israelite girl? Remember what she did? How she came to her pagan master and said, I know someone who can help you. Now we're going to contrast that with another mm. na'ar. Okay, another uh, boy in this case, but it's the same word is feminine or, or masculine, and he's going to go a totally different way, isn't he? So, ah, so there, there's something okay. really great going on here that the author is saying, I wanted to contrast two people, and then I want to ask yourself why. Why was she so generous that even though she'd been taken captive, stripped away from her family, made to be a slave in a foreign land, why could she be so generous? And yet we have a guy here who's actually relatively safe, you know, and no one's threatening him. He is a free man as far as his name and is concerned, at least. And yet he, he responds totally different. So anyway, I just I just needed to point that out because I think that is super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is. That is a great connection because talking about it yesterday it was just this little girl God will use the lowly uh, people in order to get his work done. And he uses lowly things like the water from the Jordan River um, to, <laughs> to, to cause healing. And here there is a, a lowliness, but it's not just because Gehazi is a little boy, um, but that he is unfaithful, I guess is probably the best way yes. to say it. Yeah. Now, how would, yeah. you do, how would you speak about this? Because he uses the same lingo as Elisha, as the Lord lives I will run after him and get something from him. What are your thoughts on those? Oh, words? well, yeah, okay. Well, see, now here's all kinds of other neat things that are going on language-wise. Uh, the obvious thing is, is that we've got two people making the same vow, all right? Mm -hmm. But they're totally different, aren't they? They're totally different. Mm -hmm. One is a good vow, what, what Elijah says, because his desire is to, to, to maintain the message of God's grace and mercy. And here we've got a guy who's making the same words, same vow, but he's all about greed, <laughs> all about mm -hmm. selfishness. And, and of course, there's a powerful lesson in that. It's not the words, is it? It's the heart that matters. You can be saying all the right words, but if the heart is somewhere else, then the words are empty. They're empty of any meaning. But here's the other really neat thing that's going on language-wise. So again, we have that word for Yahweh. Uh, uh, okay, as the Lord. As, uh, so mm -hmm. the, the, the original word would have been Yahweh. Uh, now, now, Brady, we, we were talking about how to pronounce uh, uh, Gehazi. Uh, how do you pronounce the word <laughs> Yahweh? How do you pronounce the word Yahweh? I just say Yahweh. Okay. Am I now, saying it wrong? Is that, is that how they would have pronounced it? I don't know. I don't know. Jehovah? We don't know. We don't said. know. <laughs> no, well, see, and you know why we don't know? So, I mean, we toss around the word Yahweh all the time. But mm -hmm. but I was reflecting on this. We don't know how they would have pronounced it. And you know why we don't know? Because they never pronounced it. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. There it is. There That's it is. right. When, when, if, if we were Jews, if you were a Jewish person reading this, you would not. Well, you would have said, Lord, that's exactly what you would have said, because that's right. what you did. You, you, substitute, you substituted uh, the name of God, which was never to be spoken. Right. Because, of course, mm -hmm. he says, don't take my name in vain. What a smart way. Well, just not say it then. <laughs> was, yeah, that, don't speak yeah. his name at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll take care of that. We don't need to worry about that. We just won't say it. Uh, um, and so what you did is you substituted the word Adonai, which is right. the Hebrew word for love. Now, here's mm -hmm. the thing that I learned that, that just tickled me. So if, if you were reading this in the Hebrew Bible, when you would come to the word Yahweh, if I can say that, <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we can. You would, you, you would find the vowels for the word Adonai. In other words, we really have no idea how they would have pronounced Yahweh because they wouldn't have put any vowels in it because you're not saying it, so we're not going to put the A E I O U in there. 
Uh, Hebrew has what we call uh, vowel pointings. They, 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 they mm-hmm. don't actually have any vowels at all. They stick things in there so you know how to pronounce it. And, and that word would have had no vowel pointings because you're not supposed to speak it. And so what they w- did then is they took the vowel pointings that went without an I and they put it in there into that Hebrew word. Am I totally confusing people or is this making any sense? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for it to see what you're going to do with this. So, yes, well, keep well, going. So, so the point is you're, you're in reading the text and you come to this word that you see the vowels for out an eye and that was a monomic device to remind you oh well that's right no i don't say that word i say out an eye in its place see it was a monomic mm-hmm. device to, so you would remember not to do that well see here's what's the interesting thing because we also have the word master in here right see mm-hmm. my master has spared this name of the Syrian and not accepting from his hand what he bought. And, and guess what the word master is in the Hebrew? It's the word Adonai. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so, so again, the author is saying, yeah, you all know. You all know the word you're supposed to use. Uh, but Gehazi, see, he's not. He's not doing that. He's speaking the name. And, and and while it was okay for Naaman, a pagan, a pagan to speak that name because he was speaking that name in faith. In faith, yeah. But now, now Gehazi is going to speak that. Name. We all know, no, this is wrong. That that he is breaking the commandment, isn't it, about not taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And can you see how the author is teaching the the Jewish people and teaching us? It, it's not about. It's not about these vocables. It's not about this word. It's about where your heart is. And of course, if you don't believe in the true God, then don't dare misuse his name. But on the other hand, if you trust that he is the only God, he's the God who can give you peace, then you ought to be speaking his name every opportunity you get. Um, uh, And again, like I said, because we don't know about Adonai, we don't know about Yahweh or however they would have said it, we miss all of that. But it's all there uh, in the Hebrew for those that would have read it originally. And that's very helpful because when we read it in English, we clearly have um, access to the Word of God. I mean, this is not like, yeah. oh, well, if you just know Hebrew, then you'd actually know the Word. Like, it just gives us a little bit of a, a wider picture of what's happening, and it makes sense because he says the right words. However, the faith that goes with those words are not there because he says, I will run after him. Okay, that's good. You know, the Lord lives. I'm yeah. going to go after him. You know, he's probably not going in peace, by the way, which is an interesting thought. And yeah. get yeah. something Ooh from him and get something from him. So there's there's a dichotomy to that, right? Go in peace or running to get something from him. Clearly not done in faith. Any last thoughts? We need to keep moving. So any last thoughts okay. before we well, The only thing we have to add is that word spared. See, my master has spared this name. And, and in that uh, word is the implication that, you know what? That guy really should have given us something. Yeah, what kind of yeah. deal is that? This this pagan, mm-hmm. this Syrian who's received this great blessing from because man, that's a great blessing to be healed of of leprosy. That doesn't happen to just anybody. He owes us something. But but that's don't right. you see that's that's at the heart of the problem. Uh, Elisha right. says it's all by grace. I didn't do anything. God did it. He did it as a free gift. Nothing's owed here. But no, Naaman has that attitude. Oh no, something's owed here. And and so I think actually when Naaman or when when uh, Gehazi leaves, mm-hmm. I think he thinks he's doing a religious act. He's yeah, just yeah. asking for what should have been asked for. Elisha has failed, but I'm going to I'm going to undo his failing. And of course, we all know the reader knows you're just you're just greedy. <laughs> what just do you mean greedy. this is a religious thing you're doing? You're just greedy. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Let's keep moving. Twenty one yeah. and twenty two. So Gehazi followed Naaman, and when Naaman saw someone running after him, once again running after yeah, him, yeah. he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master sent me to say, boom, boom. There have just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. Now, I want to highlight this quickly before we get to anything yeah. else. Is that one, he's running. Okay, so we talk about the walk, go in peace kind of language. He's not doing that. He comes down. Um, Naaman obviously is concerned. Something's going on. And he says, all is well. Well, this goes back to the Shunanite woman. 
remember the, the her 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 son dies and she ends up with Elisha and he says is all well and here's a woman who has lost her son and what does she say all is well she says yeah. it in faith and now he says is all well and he says all is well but he's not saying it in faith because it reveals right away he is a lying and so it's just this dichotomy of a woman who lost a son who is not well, but says in faith, it is well, just like our hymn, it is well with my soul because she knows the Lord is with her. Here, Gehazi says all is well, even though he's lying. So quite the dichotomy. Uh, we don't have much time, but give me a little bit of insight on this if you have any. Okay. And, and, and again, see, that it's the same word. It's it's shalom. Go in peace. Shalom. And here it is. Right. It's all shalom. And, and the same thing in the, the, the story you were referencing. But but you're right. There is no peace. There is no shalom. And, and, and Brady, I'd never thought about the emphasis on the word running. But don't you think that fits into it, too? When we don't have peace, we're running around, aren't we? We're just running around yeah. looking for something, seeking something. And when we have peace, oh, we can just take a walk. <laughs> right? And that's what it is. Right. It's just a walk with the Lord. Sometimes uphill, sometimes downhill, sometimes <laughs> the cool places, sometimes the hot places. But it's okay. It all is shalom. All is well because we're with the Lord. But when we don't have that peace, we're just running around. I, I, that, I didn't even see that, but I think that is that is cool. And like you said, though, everything from here on is just a lie. It's just a lie. Just a lie. <laughs> He's just making mm-hmm. up stories so he can get something. Yeah. So, so let's do this. Let's read 23 to 27. I want to highlight yeah. one thing about it as well, and then we will we'll wrap things up. 23 to 27. And Naaman said, Be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and laid them on two of his servants, and they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came up to the hill, he took from took them from their hand and put them in the house and sent the men away, and they departed. And went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. But he said to him, Did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and auction, male servants and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper like snow. Now, I want to see this through this lens. Is, is We have a dichotomy of Naaman, who has just been told, go in peace. And this is a connection for us on Sunday. On Sunday, we had a baptism. And after baptism, we sang the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And that kind of happened more like I had planned the service, and then I then I had forgotten we're going to have a baptism. Yeah. So I added the baptismal yeah. rite. Usually I'll have like God's own child, I gladly say it, or a baptismal hymn. And but I, I didn't do that. I put it is well with my soul, kind of just by you know the Holy Spirit working through this. And it struck me a lot. And this connects to this is that that baptism happens. One, I'm I'm happy I didn't mess it up. That's one thing. Um, but then the family. This is why they're here. It is well with my soul. Connects to everything that Naaman is doing these things because it is well with his soul. And and like you said, Gehazi is running around. It is not well with his soul. And so he just kind of keeps making up stuff and taking the money and sending people away and all of this and lies and lies upon lies. And Elisha just needs to say, by the way, God gave me a vision and you did this and you did this. It's just such a dichotomy of it is well versus it is not well. Any other thoughts on this text? Well, just just what I had said earlier, though, too. So, so this is a very sad inning, but again, Kings is a very sad book. Uh, mm. and, and so, well, you know why you're in exile? You know why you're in exile, because you were also hypocrites. You said the words, but you didn't really mean them. You, you claimed to worship God, and yet at the same time you were worshiping Baal. You did not turn to the Lord in the time of need. You, you tried it, to, right? Because isn't that what the Israelites did is what Gehazi did. Oh, we'll take this on our own. We'll make foreign allies. Uh, we, 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 you know, we can take care of this. We don't need to turn to God in, in the face of the Assyrians and then finally the Babylonians. But, but in the midst of this, so there's this hope. Because all you got to do is what Naaman did. You just go back to the Lord and say, all right, I, I, I was wrong. I, I realize now there is only one God on this earth, and it is the God of Israel. And he'll give you the peace you're looking for. But you got to quit running around. 
you know, isn't that what Jesus, he constantly gives these words where he just says, stay, stay, mm-hmm. you know, steadfast, which means don't run around, just stay in one, you, you just stay with the Lord and, and it'll all be all right. Even, even if you're a leper, it, it can be all right. It was all right for Naaman. It, it can be all right for you, Gehazi. It's just a matter of where you're going to put your trust. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that fact because, see, that comes across like there's something for us to do. And, and really, trust is just that realization that we can't do anything. We are totally inadequate. And yet the Lord has chosen to do everything for us here on earth and eternally. So, uh, yeah. It's it's interesting. I I did a talk uh, uh, last year and and one of the it was on a YouTube video for uh, for a conference actually in Norway. It was a lot of fun. Oh, and wow. it was uh freed to serve to have peace, I think is the title of it. And and one of the gals I know from Norway, she she heard it and she said, "You know what? You know what, Brady? Um a couple years ago, uh if I heard this, I'd be like, yeah, that's nice." And then I would go home and get to work, you know, and now, now she has children. And so she said, when I go to church, <laughs> um, what you said really made sense is because I need to realize what's happening and that it's that peace that I am because it's the Lord's peace. And I think yeah. that really is revealed in this uh, text and a very important thing for us. These words go in peace. Now, pastor, we have about a minute left. I want to do this. Can you talk a little bit to verse 27? So now the leprosy that was on Naaman is now going to be on Gehazi. What is God doing here? Well, see, that, that, that's the beautiful thing here. It, it's the thing God has control over, which is leprosy. All right? So God can put leprosy on you, and, and justly so. If you're Gehazi, can you say that I don't deserve this? Well, pretty much you do. You, you lied. <laughs> you were a hypocrite. You claimed you were doing things for good reasons, but really it was all about yourself. By the way, what do you think? What do you think Elijah was going to say when when he showed up in this new outfit? <laughs> right, <laughs> Where'd you get right. that from? Well, well, well whatever, <laughs> whatever. But you see, that's okay if God puts leprosy on you because we've already established God can heal lepers. He can yeah. do that, and he can do it for people that totally don't deserve it, people who are actually oppressing his people, people who are pagans. So, so Gehazi, this is a problem, but I think it's pretty clear what you need to do. You just go to the Lord in repentance, and then wait, and the Lord will take care of it when it's time, when it's right. Isn't that what Paul said? He prayed three times for the thorn. God said, ah, it's not time for that. My grace is sufficient for you. Uh, and for all of us, because we all got things that we're dealing with, leprosies of a sort. Uh, and, and I'm telling you, I, I know one person who can take care of it, and I know you can't. So if I were you, I would just keep going to the Lord, trust in the Lord, and, and he will, because he, he can do it. He will grant you the healing when and where it's, it's best for you and for all those around you. So that's the great thing. He could have done something else to Gehazi, and Gehazi would have been wondering, well, I don't know, what am I going to do? No, he, he put a thing on him that he knows God can deal with, and God wants to deal with. Yeah. Pastor John Lekomsky, co-host of Wrestling with the Basics here on KFUO, strengthen us by God's word from 2 Kings chapter 5. Pastor Lekomsky, thank you for being our guest. Thank you, Brady. Saints of our Lord, Gehazi just wanted to get something from a generous man. No harm, no foul, no big deal. A little money, some clothes. It was basically offered to Elisha anyways, but the reality is he was sinning and he was running around where he should have had peace. What we have is peace with our Lord. Forgiveness that wasn't free, but is freely given to you. Saints of our Lord, go in peace. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hands.